today I want to talk about uh, new forms of worker organizations in the GTA uh, and at Pearson Airport uh, in particular, and I think the best way to do this is for me to just kind of uh, jump into it. So, the labor movement is in crisis. I think at this point that's like a pretty banal observation, actually. We all know the story of following union density uh, and union power, and I think people uh, both in the labor movement and outside of the labor movement basically uh, see this. But when we talk about the labor movement being in crisis, we typically are talking about the union movement specifically. And I think it's a mistake that over time these two things, the labor movement on the one hand, a broader thing, and the union, union movement uh, in particular, a more specific thing, have been conflated. Right? And so before legally regulated trade unions became the dominant form of worker organization uh, you know, in the post-war period, unions were only one form of worker organization amongst many others, right? So we had mutual aid societies, co-ops, sporting clubs, consumer organizations, a whole host of types of workers' organizations. And also before the contemporary trade union form became dominant, there were other models of unionism, right? And syndicalism is probably the most uh, notable or significant competing form, but there were also other variations. And so I think in this context of crisis, we need to look to the ways that workers in the past, but also in their own context, have uh, innovated and invented new forms of organizations which were designed to fight the battles in which they found themselves in. And so for me, if there's any hope for working people, it is in development of new forms uh, of these organizations and new forms of working class formation. And so to build these new forms of class power, uh, I think not all of these organizations could or should be workplace-based, right? Some should be based uh, in other spheres of working class life. So one example would be struggles around what people in the academy called social reproduction, right, or consumption. Uh, and so maybe to concretize this and make a bit of a bold claim, I kind of think if we're looking around the GTA or Southern Ontario, one of the most significant labor mobilizations with like a small L is the tenant organizing and rent strikes uh, that are going on in Parkdale and are now spread to other neighborhoods uh, and cities. Uh, but that said, obviously, these new forms of organization should also exist in the workplace. Um, not just because workplaces are just also sites where people face oppression and injustice, but I think, like Scott said, uh, workers continue to have potential to exercise incredible amounts of power, economic power. Um, and so what could these things look like? Some, I think, should be uh, experiments with different kinds of unionism, like unrecognized and unregulated unions, right? Unions with a small u that look kind of more like unions did before the contemporary legal framework, uh, what some people like Stott and Lind have called solidarity unions, right? So uh, these are organizations of workers that don't have recognition, that don't collectively bargain in the sense that we typically think of it, but exercise direct economic power on the boss to win demands instead of this more legalistic and bureaucratic uh, collective bargaining or grievance procedure strategy. And what these forms of unions have as an advantage is that they aren't constrained by labor law and regulation, right? So this means they can be minority. It doesn't have to be 50% plus one uh, of workers in a workplace uh, that have successfully certified, but smaller groups of workers can get together and still fight for their own interests um, and the interests in the workplace more broadly. And related to this, they can have membership-based uh, and defined memberships rather than memberships which are imposed by a labor board. Uh, and most importantly, they cannot be fined for illegal strike activity. And so, of course, I think I know everybody in the room is saying, yeah, but what about all the trade-offs? And I think that's a fair point. Uh, recognition clearly grants a certain amount of stability, and things like a grievance procedure have many advantages, even if there are limitations. 
Um, but I think we do have to really think through uh, what the, the cost benefit of engaging with this legal labor regime is and admit that even at its best, uh, things like stability, grievance procedure, legalized collective bargaining are available to a relatively small layer of workers in society. Um, and so I'll see what people say in the Q&A about that. But I want to take the rest of my time to talk about a different kind of new form of worker organization, uh, which is the Toronto Airport Workers Council. And so this is an uh, initiative to form a non-union workers organization in a very complex relation, uh, environment of labor relations. And so I'm currently working on a paper with a co-author, uh, Paul Gray, who I just want to mention so that he gets his uh, due acknowledgement. Uh, but Paul and I have been involved in efforts uh, to support uh, the council at Pearson, uh, especially through some worker education initiatives, which I'm going to talk about, um, but to get to the council. So at Pearson, there are 40,000 workers. It's Canada's biggest workplace. There's something like 320 employers and 12 different unions. And over the past few decades, workers at Pearson have seen a sharp decline in compensation and working conditions. Right, so just to give kind of one example of this contract flipping where whole workforces have to reapply for their jobs when employer switches subcontractors uh, is a major issue and a major culprit of this trend. Uh, you know, workers who started making uh, a starting salary of say $20 an hour in the early 90s are sometimes making less than that now through a process of contract flipping. Uh, and this also, this practice also uh, creates major challenges for union security and limits union gains, right? And if workers who are facing layers of subcontracting <coughs> fight from below to improve their conditions, they can have the unintended consequence of pricing themselves out of a job. Uh, but there are other issues too. Uh, at the airport, significantly health and safety. Uh, so most recently there have been deaths of ground crew workers in 2012, 2014, and 2016. And there's all sorts of other issues uh, that we could get into as well. Other forms of precarious employment, uh, low paid work, work intensity, job security, that kind of thing. So it's in this context that a small but significant group of workers have created an airport-wide workers organization, or at this Toronto Airport Workers Council, which critically is open to all workers regardless of employer or union affiliation. And so the council recognizes, uh, sorry, it represents an exciting and significant attempt at a new kind of unionism, I think, which is more explicitly class focused uh, in its orientation and in its attempt to overcome some of the barriers of what I might call conventional trade unions. Some of those things like sectionalism, the tendency of Unions to only fight on the kind of narrow interests of their own members. Uh, economism, the tendency to fight, you know, for wage and uh, benefit gains at the expense of other things, say, social programs more broadly. Uh, and this legalistic framework, which has certain uh, limits and places certain constraints on unions. So very critically, the. Airport Worker Council has managed to win recognition from the Greater Toronto Airports Authority, which is the nonprofit entity that manages uh, Pearson. And so the Airport Authority and the Workers' Council meet together 10 times a year to discuss airport wide issues. Uh, but again, the council isn't a union and it doesn't collectively bargain. So the way that it advances its interests is through campaigns and especially a kind of direct action orientation. And so the council was a major player in the fight to reduce fares on the Union Pearson Express, the commuter train from Union Station to Pearson. Uh, and it's actively been involved in the Provincial Fight for 15 campaign, as well as kind of its own campaign for a $15 plus minimum wage at the airport. And it also serves as a kind of hub, a way to organize something like airport-wide uh, flying squads when the different individual locals at the union are, say, on strike. 
Uh, so, for example, when Teamsters were on strike uh, in 2017 at Graham Greer, thanks, uh, the council was a major source of organizing support uh, for them. Uh, 